この世に悪があるとすれば、それは人の心だ。Did you hear that, dear viewer? Voice acting in a SNES game. Horribly muffled and compressed voice acting, but voice acting nonetheless. This will immediately clue you into where Tales of Fantasia's identity and ambitions lie. This game goes for a greater cinematic flair than other JRPGs of the time. When you first boot the game up and watch the intro, the voice actors for each of the characters are put front and center, just like in a movie. This game has its own catchy J pop theme song that plays over the opening. Now, in the years since 1995, we've heard tons of vocal songs in games, but back in 95 on the Super Famicom, this was a unique. You even meet the singer of the song in game and can have her perform it for you. Or you can have a dog sing it for you. Either way, this game knows it's got something special going on and it is ready to flex this. Unless you're playing the GBA version, in which case the vocal song is removed and replaced with another much blander song. The developers likely conceded that the tinny speakers of the GBA were unable to do the song justice. So, what kind of game is this opening setting us up for anyway? Well, Tales of Fantasia is an action RPG that was released on the Super Famicom in 1995 but never saw a release outside of Japan. This is a shame because if it had, I have no doubt that it would have become famous enough to be recognized even by non RPG fans like Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VII are. The game has received numerous re releases, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. I'm playing a fan translation hack of the original Super Famicom version. The PS1 version also has a fan translation and improved gameplay, but I just love these SNES sprites and the sound font too much to pass them up. The GBA version has an English translation, but it's not a very good one, infamous for somehow turning the fabled Ragnarok War into the Kangaroo War. The gameplay loop resembles what we've seen in many other JRPGs, even in the present day. You follow along with a fantasy plot, talk to NPCs in towns to gain information on how to achieve your next goal, buy new equipment and consumable items, wander across a simple overworld, and dive into dungeons to find treasure and fight bosses. It's good stuff, but a dance we've danced many times before. The battle system of this game is wholly unique, however. It resembles a scrolling brawler like Streets of Rage, but is still unmistakably an RPG. You can learn all kinds of skills and assign them to the attack buttons before you get into combat. Selecting a move will commit your character to a long attack animation against enemies that move around and attack in real time. There's a distinct back and forth to the combat as well as an ever changing rhythm. You've got three helper characters backing you up with heals and powerful ranged attacks. Spells freeze the action and have long animations, giving the combat a slow but sometimes stressful pace that makes it feel different from any beat em up. Or any game at all, really. I've truly never seen a game like this, not even future Tales games, of which there are many. All your attacks are voice acted, as the characters call the names of their attacks, just like in plenty of anime or modern JRPGs. This is where the bulk of the game's voice acting lies, with the only other instances of it being the vocal intro song and some select cutscenes. The other area this game stands out in is presentation and technical mastery. The environments in this game are vibrant, lovingly crafted, and full of little details. Lots of areas will have wildlife running around in them that serve absolutely no other purpose than to make the places a bit more pleasant to be in. Law of conservation of detail be damned! Several of the game's visual effects like reflections, ripples, and the powerful magic attacks are beyond what you see in almost any other SNES game. The character sprites are full of charm and energy too. This game is an absolute treat for lovers of sprite art such as myself. Unless you're playing the GBA version, in which case the sprites are ugly and the color palette is washed out. The game's soundtrack helps in bringing all these wonderful environments to life as well. 
There's just the one vocal song, but Motoi Sakuraba and the other composers make great use of the Super Famicom's awesome sound chips, from the delightful little claps included in Alvanese's theme, to the bass twangs of the third overworld theme, to the soothing forest and oasis themes, every single song is a hit. You can even pay for a piano performance at one of the nightclubs such as the confidence of Wolf Team and Namco in the game they've produced. But in truth, Wolf Team and Namco had plenty of reasons to not feel confident. Tales of Fantasia had a troubled development and the first symptom of this can be seen when examining the game's story. So as I said in the beginning, this game has a cinematic flair that goes beyond most other games of the early 90s. The story is involved and varied with plenty of fun side scenes and distractions to help us get to know the characters better. Let's talk a bit about those characters. You'll be playing the game as Cress or Kless as he's called in early translations. This is of course complete nonsense as his name is obviously supposed to be in a team with that of female lead mint you know crescent mint could potentially be a tasty combination on your egg salad sandwich Cress really is your boring jrpg protagonist he uses a sword his hometown was destroyed by the bad guy he trains as a warrior and has to find a magic sword to save the world once and for <sighs> you get the idea there are early hints at Cress becoming blinded by his thirst for revenge and an unwillingness to listen to reason, but this never leads to anywhere and he ends up as a protagonist with minimal death. Mint doesn't fare much better. She's your timid, wet blanket, female love interest healer character who cares about everybody and is just so nice. Mint and Cress do have some genuinely nice and cute moments together that I do appreciate however. After that you've got Klaus aka Clark, who is like a combination of a witch doctor, a mad scientist and old man Joseph Joestar. It honestly feels more like he's the main character for big chunks of this story and I'm quite fond of him. You've also got Arch or Arche, Ugh, you're killing me with these names. She rides a broomstick and manages to have a much more robust personality than Mint does and her sadder and more emotional scenes hit much harder. Beyond that, you've got Chester, he has a bow, and of course you have the man himself, Edward D. Morrison. This guy isn't a party member and doesn't get a ton of screen time, but he's important to the plot and also the biggest badass in the game as in the opening he is seen kicking the main villain's ass with the first spell to ever be cast in the entire Tales franchise and it is epic. Unless you're playing the GBA version, in which case the scene is ruined by horrendous voice acting. Now the overall plot is quite good and filled with some truly gut punching moments but these are greatly spaced apart by long stretches of storytelling that can feel standard and unimpressive. The flow of events can feel odd. This isn't exactly surprising as there's a lot of time travel in this story and the game has fun creating time paradoxes and altering history but even so it can be dissatisfying. One of the first things you do in this game is visit a tree where a spirit of a woman tells you must restore and protect it seems pretty important, right? Well it is, but before it gains much of any plot focus, you will spend 10 hours running around the map gathering elemental spirits for Klaus that will help you be strong enough to defeat the main villain Daus. In the backstory of the game, Daus is defeated by these four heroes. You travel back in time and meet one of them, but the other three never show up. Then the story very abruptly switches from we need to train and become stronger to okay let's go beat Daos. You will be at the door of his lair and fighting him before you've even adjusted to this sudden shift in gears. And you do beat him. You kick his ass. But he escapes through time to the future and your characters are like okay we'll have to follow him. But first they must cure the special tree and guys I cannot convey how casually the game delivers this. It's so matter of fact the way it's like oh by the way. Don't forget about this tree that has enormous significance but we've done nothing to keep it relevant in the player's mind before now and you kinda just cure it. 
Some random schmuck with no other plot significance conveniently tells you there's a unicorn nearby who has the power to cure anything, so you get to work on finding it. Some of Dao's minions get in your way, even though it's later revealed that Dao's wants the tree to be cured as well. What is this clusterfuck of a story? There's more. So there's a king in the game who gives you a spear as a reward for your heroics and it will likely sit in your inventory forgotten about until later on when out of nowhere a Valkyrie shows up and demands it back. Cress agrees but only if she loans him her flying horse so he can fight off some demons. It's a pretty exciting scene but it comes completely out of nowhere, does not get followed up on and the characters barely question it. The horse is called Pegasus even though it's obviously safe near. Honestly, I'm making this game's story sound worse than it actually is. I'm rather fond of it, the game's highlights land perfectly, you'll always want to know what's coming next, the backstory, setting and flavour of the world are well developed and the late game twists don't disappoint. Douse is an excellent villain, ultimately a person who was so desperate to save something that he blinded himself to the collateral damage his efforts were causing. But it can feel a bit like you're only seeing a small part of a bigger story, and that's because you are. The story is adapted from an unpublished novel written by Yoshiharu Gotanda, who at the time was a young and promising programmer excited to see his story turned into this cinematic and ambitious game. The novel was a three-part story detailing the backstory and motivations of Douse as well as his early time on the world of Aselia and his interactions with Winona Pickford who can be seen lying dead in the prologue of the game. This part of the story was later adapted as a Japan-only novel called Tales of Fantasia Katararizaru Rekishi. It was penned by Ryuji Matsuri, presumably without any input or permission from Gotanda, who is the original creator of the story. The second part focuses on Rhea Scarlet and her quest for revenge against Daos for his murderous rampage. This part was heavily cut down in the video game and Rhea has only a minor role. The third part covers the adventures of Cress and his friends, which is what we get to experience here. The heavy cuts imposed on Wolf Team by Namco led to Gotanda and several other staff members leaving the project and the team in disagreement. They formed their own team called Triace and continue to produce games of their own to this day. The original story and the rest of the Tales franchise remain in Namco's ownership. In many ways, this game is what started Namco Bandai on their transformation from the guys who made Pac-Man machines for game arcades into the diverse publisher they are today. Now I'm not going to comment on whether the executive decisions imposed on the project by Namco were good or bad because I can't be sure. I also don't want to be offended on behalf of Mr. Gotanda. What I can say however is that Namco have definitely been dicks with regards to some of the later releases of this game. I know I've been ragging on the GBA version a lot but it actually gets worse. Meet Tales of Fantasia for mobile devices. This release takes the GBA version of the game makes all the monsters more powerful and makes you level up more slowly turning the game into a total grind fest. And all the while the game dangles EXP boosts that you pay for with real life money in front of your face. It's all the scummy mobile game traits we've seen elsewhere this time being used to mutilate a classic game or legendary RPG as Namco likes to call it. Much more attractive are the two PSP remakes which are very similar to each other. You've got the full voice edition and Tales of Fantasia Cross because Namco just can't get enough of releasing this game apparently. These versions are especially attractive because they're the only ones that don't freeze the gameplay during the spell animation. This massively speeds up the combat and shortens the game overall. Unfortunately there's no fan translation patch of them currently so you'll just have to figure the Japanese out by yourself. Now if you want to play the game for yourself, I highly recommend weighing up the pros and cons of each version. I say this because while I am very fond of the Super Famicom version and find it very charming, I must admit I used save states and a walkthrough to get through the last third of this game because the flaws were starting to get to me and I just wanted it to be over. This game isn't exactly easy, even in the early game, take a look at this dungeon. 
there's this smoke in the room that hurts you. Normally in a game you would turn back and get an item that protects you or there's a switch you flip nearby to give you a safe path. Well, in this case you have to block the holes that the gas is coming through and that involves wading deep into this harmful room and you just have to eat the damage and watch your HP carefully. It's pretty demanding. And when you're up against some cryptic puzzles and huge mazes in late game areas coupled with a high encounter rate, trying to get through with no outside resources is going to become a long test of patience and dedication. This game took me 40 hours to beat, which was longer than I was expecting, and I feel like a significant portion of that length came from how slow the fights can be. Those spell animations are just too damn long. This is an action RPG, but lots of fights are slower than in some turn-based RPGs. Turns out that even back in the 90s, AAA releases fell victim to favouring style over substance. There were many moments where I really wished I was playing the PS1 version. Sure the sprites are uglier and spells still freeze the gameplay but the encounter rate is lowered, there are new scenes and party chat, there's a new playable character and look, you can do actual combos in battle making it play more like a 2D fighter. I said earlier that the game took steps to distance itself from this genre but maybe this is what the developers had envisioned all along and the unique flow of the Super Famicom version was born from technical limitations or developer inexperience. Ultimately, I don't regret choosing the Super Famicom version. It certainly has flaws, but it felt amazing to discover a game that should have been a smash hit among Western JRPG fans if it had only got a release. The long-lasting impact of the game can't be denied. It kicked off one of the biggest JRPG series ever. It spawned plenty of related works like sequel games, audio dramas, a crappy two-hour anime that I've been taking footage from in this movie, and a prequel novel. It was a turning point for Namco's brand image. This game is a piece of history and something that anybody who is passionate about JRPGs should familiarise themselves with. And of course, you can't talk about Tales of Fantasia without mentioning the infamous Super Famicom translation from Deja. Unlike other translations of this game, which are fairly standard, the SNES Deja translation is notorious for exaggerating some of the characters' personalities. Sometimes I felt I couldn't trust this translation was accurately portraying the characters but after researching things further I can say that it's mostly fine and more accurate than I was first expecting. The translation indulges in some very crude humour at times, mostly revolving around Arche. This can be off-putting to some players. It's definitely something that makes you want to groan and roll your eyes when you see it now in 2021 but things were a bit different at the time. This fan translation is old. It's one of the oldest full patches of a Japan-only game. And back in 2001, a lot of us were disgruntled at the overzealous censorship that Nintendo of America and other companies were putting on games. Removing the religious elements from ActRaiser, cutting entire scenes out of Breath of Fire 4, a laundry list of changes to Castlevania, toning down the script of Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VI jumping through hoops to avoid saying a character was suicidal and all kinds of other changes made for the worse. This fan translation can be considered a rebellion against a smothering, overprotective parent. It comes from the Wild West period of fan projects from a time before when standards were set. Just like everything else in Tales of Fantasia, this fan translation is a piece of history. When going back to games that are over 20 years old, it's important to think like you're in that era. In fact, you could even say the reason to play the game is to aid you in thinking that way and understanding how we felt during those years. It's almost like a spiritual journey to me. Like when I realised the game facts guide I was following was written by somebody 20 years ago, I just had to sit back in my chair for a few minutes and take it all in. That the efforts of one Argentinian nerd to make this game more accessible in 2001 were helping my Irish ass in 2021 really makes you love the internet. Tales of Fantasia stands as a very important component of what made that era so special and we can still feel its legacy today. 
Both the fan translation and the game itself are clumsy and flawed, but they are trailblazers, highly ambitious and very, very charming. I love them both, warts and all.